I just love seeing Holy Spirit moving because he does things in ways we couldn't imagine or even expect and he does it so beautifully and it's just wonderful seeing people being released um, to be, to be part of that body, to be part of that glorious bride, you know, being released. Um, as, uh, as we were singing there, I was reminded of, um, it's um, a few years back when um, Boris Johnson, of all people, when um, all the Brexit and all of that was going on. And there was a big headline in the paper and it said, let my people go. And it really hit my spirit because that's the cry. Um, that's my cry as an intercessor, as a prayer. Let my people go from whatever has held us, whether it's a spirit of religion, a spirit of deception, whatever has held us. It's time his people went. You know, they were released to be who we've been called to be. And, you know, we are here for such a time as this. We are part of the United Kingdom. Even though there's, you know, um, things that have happened like in Scotland with referendums trying to cut themselves off, the Lord has created us as a United Kingdom. And when we were speaking before with Pam, she was saying, you know, some intercessors she's prayed with, you know, they talk about America and what happens in America comes here. No, no, we're created as United Kingdom. We are different to America. We have a rich heritage. Um, you only look back, you know, to some of these saints of old. Um, we are a prophetic and apostolic nation. And, you know, it's about time we rose up as prophetic people and apostolic people to really rise up and be, again, the nation God created us to be. And that is all part of intercession. You know, that's what God places on us. You know, so, you know, um, it's, it's really important that we hear what is Holy Spirit saying to us about where we live, you know, and um, just um, totally going off notes here, but um, when my husband and I, um, we moved to St. Helens, um, Ian was from St. Helens, um, I had been part of an intercessory group there. And, you know, for eight years, we just went all around the different churches, you know, based on Genesis 26 about opening the wells, you know. And a lot of it was as much for us, you know, getting rid of the rubbish that we were carrying, but also in the churches. And we know that St. Helens was actually, in one of the census, was said it was the most religious um, town in the, in the country. But that's not what we're seeing at all. Um, so anyway, we, um, my, my husband's into history, um, and since he's retired from being head of a Methodist school, God's really placed on his heart about the heritage of the town and about rediscovering the treasures. You see, St. Helens is a unique town because it's a, no, it's a pioneering town. You know, it's the first for so many things. The first for the glass, the Pilkingtons, um, first for the floating glass. It was the first for the passenger railway um, trains, um, Rainhill trials. You know, it was the first, um, in fact, it was the first female footballer as well. You know, so there's so many firsts. So it's got a pioneering spirit. And, you know, it's as we discover in intercession about our place where we are based then we can pray more effectively because then we're releasing what god created that town to be you know and and later on i might be i might share a little bit about what we're seeing being released because hope is beginning to rise again in the town which is really good and so i come you know to share stories but to say you know there's such power when we intercede you know one of the saddest verses in the Bible, um, apart from the one I quoted before about the disciples falling asleep, um, is Ezekiel 22, verse 30, when he says, I looked for a man among them who will build up the wall and stand in the gap on behalf of the land so that I would not have to destroy it, but I found none.
Intercession is about being rightly positioned, being in the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing with the right people so that heaven can come to earth. And each one of us in this room, we have been positioned exactly where we are for a reason. All of us are intercessors, every single one of us, every single one of us. Remember the disciples when they asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, it should really be the disciples' prayer, but it, is a, um, it sets the model, really, of how to pray. And it starts off by our Father. So knowing we are his children, knowing who, who we are, you know, our identity in him. And then our Father who art in heaven. You know, we recognize he is sovereign. He is the one who's in control of the whole earth. He's in control of everything. And he's even in control of man, you know, little man. Who is man that he's mindful of? You know, he is in control. Um, and then the next part, um, obviously, hallowed be thy name. You know, we, we, we've been worshipping, we've been declaring how incredible he is, how holy he is, um, how beautiful he is. But the next part, this is the intercession bit. We pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we're praying as intercessors. We are praying. We're keying in to the heart of the Father. We're keying in to his spirit and we're saying, what does it look like for your for what's in heaven to come down to earth. We're not praying what we desire. We're praying what the Father desires. And it's, it's, it's it can, you know, um, it, it's very slight. You can be deceived so easily because we can pray from our flesh. And I don't know about you, but in the last few years especially, because God's been dealing with a lot of things to do with family, and when anything's connected with family, it touches your emotions. And then you can start praying things from your emotions rather than from your spirit. And so the Lord has been really dealing with a lot of stuff with me, um, how I'm praying. So I'm praying what his will is and not mine. You know, um, and that's what the Lord, you know, the Lord is wanting to um, sort us out, basically, um, all the stuff so that we can be those holy, consecrated people. And it says, doesn't it, in James about the, um, the effective prayers of a righteous saint. You know, how effective they are when we are right, when there is no sin blocking us when we're speaking to the Lord, you know, is so important. And so, you know, all the things that the Holy Spirit highlights to us, we've just got to respond to it. Intercessors, we love God's presence and intimacy. That is the top priority. We just want to spend time with him. That's what it's all about. We're just speaking to him. We're hearing his heart and then we're praying it into being. It's not a case like um, Robert was saying that you know you have to spend hours and hours and hours in a in a closet. Although some people might be called to do that, you know, um, and you, you see people like you know Elijah when he positioned himself to pray for the rain, he earnestly prayed for the rain, and he was like in a position where he was travailing in prayer. You know, not everyone is called to do that, but all of us are called to pray for our families for um, our schools, for our businesses, for the area where we live, for the leaders, especially the leaders, we're called to pray. So intercessors, they're humble, they're quick to deal with their sin because we don't want anything blocking us from being used by the awesome God. You know, we bring our burdens to God. We choose to stand in the gap in prayer between what's happening on the earth and what can happen when heaven is released. You know, our role is to touch God's heart. 
by dwelling in the throne room of heaven and being used by God to release the solutions, bringing God's transforming power to earth. You see, we don't have to do anything in the sense of God's done it all, you know, and we are just his vessels through whom he chooses to release things, you know. So it's not about how hard we pray or how many hours we spend. It's just about connecting with his heart and hearing what he has to say and what he wants to release. Psalm 25, verse 14, I love this verse. It says, the Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. And in one translation, it talks about how um, that he shares his secrets with his lovers. I want to be such a lover of the Lord that he shares his secrets with me. You know, and it's that intimacy. You see, we can't, we can't pray with that intimacy. It just doesn't work. Because, you know, the more we spend time with the Lord and the more obedient we are to the Lord, the more he can trust us with, you know. Um, And intercession can be done anytime, anywhere, you know. Even when you're just, you know, having a wash in the morning, you know, uh, just before you're going to sleep, anytime. You, know, you can just be praying, and it's amazing what the Holy Spirit will show. And I'm, I know so many of you are walking and guiding, guided by the Holy Spirit. But just imagine if the whole church is mobilized to be led by the Holy Spirit and not by what we see, but by the Holy Spirit. Just imagine this area here, what could happen if everyone took their responsibility and not leave it to the leaders, (laughs) if everyone did their little bit, because you are here for such a time as this, to hear, and we're here to encourage you. You know, we're fortunate that we're able to go to other churches up and down the country. And, you know, going up to um, the Cairngorms and seeing God releasing, especially the men, to be who they are meant to be. You know, and there's something about the brave heart, the lion heart. And we saw men physically rising up with that strong, courageous spirit. You know, and each of us is different. But Holy Spirit knows that, you know. Um, So it's just amazing that as we spend time with the Lord, you know, we grow in confidence because we understand our identity as God's children. We don't struggle with intimidation. We don't operate out of a place of brokenness or rejection because we experience God's heart of love and compassion. And that's the place we pray from for those around us. My own background, that um, I went to an Anglican church and I was filled with the word of God. And then when I was in my early 20s, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it was an amazing time. It was just like an axe. You know, I was drunk in the Spirit. I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I was giggling. It was amazing. And then I shared with our pastor, you know, what had happened. And he said, we don't do that in our church. And straight away, it was blocked. And I spent 10 or so years not flowing in the Holy Spirit. And it was only when I actually went to St. Helens and and then I knew there was something really different. Yes, obviously we have the Holy Spirit, but when the church blocks that off you, then it's so sad, you know. And thankfully, you know, I met people who were full of the Spirit and the Word. And I can tell you, Something amazing happened because when the Holy Spirit was allowed to be released in me, it hit the word and I became alive like I have never, ever been. It was amazing, absolutely incredible. And you see, we don't understand, do we, when we come under authority, what is happening sometimes, you know. And I had to forgive, you know, this leader because of the control and the manipulation, you know. In fact, I had to forgive the Church of England, as a, as a structure, because of what they had done, you know. 
and um, because God wants to see his people free to be who we are called to be so that we can each of our each of us do our little part in building the wall repairing you know and so that when people see the bride they go wow look at the bride wow i want to i want to find out what is it that you carry i want that you know, I, I remember this um, Jonathan Aliadi, some of you may know him. Um, he's a great man of prayer, uh, based in London. And uh, I remember one of the first talks he gave, and he said, so he'd come from Nigeria, and he was only meant to stay a short time, but the Lord had other <laughs> plans. And so he's really an um, amazing guy because he's got such an anointing to release the light of Christ. And he said, one of the first things he said was, I am so glad I met the groom before I met the bride and isn't that sad isn't that sad you know so I want to be I want the world to see the the bride you know this is what Mike was praying to see the glorious bride the one bride the bride that is just glowing with the light of Christ you know so um God has got his intercessors all over this land and with Jonathan it's very much about joining the dots bringing people together it's about releasing the light and there's a whole concerted effort to take the light out into the communities in December there's a, a weekend and it's all about letting the people see the light of Christ not in churches out in the community because that's where they need to see So I'm just going to pray Ephesians um, prayer um, just over us. Um, Ephesians 3. I pray that you would, Heavenly Father, unveil within each one of us the unlimited riches of your glory and favor until supernatural strength floods our innermost being with your divine might and explosive power. In the name of Jesus, amen. You see, if we are real, authentic intercessors, we need to be constantly refreshed. We need to be refueled and refired so we don't carry the burdens on our own. You know, it's because it becomes very tiring and wearing if we do. Um, so we need that constant refreshment of the Holy Spirit. We need that constant refreshment. And then, as it continues in Ephesians, it says, And then, by constantly using our faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside of us. And the resting place of his love will become the very source and the root of our lives. Then we will be empowered to discover what every Holy One experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. This extravagant love pouring into us until we're filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Wow, what a prayer to pray. Whoa, most days I pray that. Whoa, isn't that incredible prayer? Whoa, you know, some of the prayers you find in the Bible, they're just incredible. Some of Paul's prayers. And, you know, it's no wonder he prayed prayers like that because it was, it's tough, isn't it? It's tough in this world. You know, Paul, you know, all the things he went through, the shipwreck and all the attempts on his life, the stoning and all that stuff. No wonder he prayed prayers like that. You know, and no wonder we as intercessors we need to pray those prayers not just for ourselves but our families for our church you know for our neighborhood where we live we pray that 
I was speaking to someone yesterday and was saying just how important it is for us to use our voice. You know, this whole decade, you know, in the Hebrew is the pay, which is the mouth. How important it is to speak out because the church has lost its voice, become weak and powerless. How important it is that we, as we intercede, we declare the truth because what is released from our mouths is so, so powerful. It's no wonder there was a pandemic where people had to wear masks because the enemy just wanted to silence his people. But, you know, we really need to speak out the truth, declare things. Never, ever doubt. This is still the Ephesians prayer. Never, ever doubt God's mighty power to work in us and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than our greatest request, our most unbelievable dream, and exceed our wildest imagination. He will outdo them all, for his miraculous power constantly energizes us. Wow, that's incredible. Remember, um, Sue, you probably remember where I was in, um, I think it was one of the docks where they had this big sign, Dream Bigger. Do you remember? Yeah. And you know, dream bigger. This is the time for us to really dream bigger. You know, what can the Lord do when we are fully surrendered to him and allow his Holy Spirit to flow through us? When our eyes are not on hurting other members of the body of Christ, when our eyes are on him, him alone. Wow. When we are working in harmony with each other. You know, when we have dealt with the stuff, when we have repented, when we have asked for forgiveness, when we can just, you know, we are those holy vessels. And God can really, really, really use us so powerfully. Powerful intercessors are people of great courage and strong faith because they believe and trust a mighty God who can do immeasurably more then we can dream or imagine. You know, in Daniel, it says, doesn't it? Um, those who trust in the Lord, you know, will do mighty exploits for him. Let's have a little look at Joseph. See, despite a nightmare few years, you know, Joseph, we, we know his story and all the things he went through. You know, I wonder if you look at your life and see all the different things that have happened. But you see... They were all preparing us for now. So during those few nightmare years, Joseph was finally in the right place at the right time to provide for his nation and his family. And he carefully listened to God and simply obeyed him. Now all of us, we can be an influence, not just for our families, but in the marketplace, whether we work there or not. You know, like Joseph, it is really good for us to build good relationships with the secular leaders in our communities. And we should look for ways to genuinely encourage them and let them know we're praying for them. Now, during the pandemic, um, Ian and I, because we've both been in education, we have felt a real heart to write a letter to every single head teacher within the primary school, within the secondary school, within the colleges, and to say, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. And we just wanted to let you know that in these really difficult times, we're praying for you. You know, and there was a group of us who we, we met over Zoom, of course, because you couldn't meet. Um, but we were praying um, for our town. And it was people from different denominations. We were praying for our town. And, and things were starting to stir, you know. And then, um, you know, the Lord was really doing stuff with Ian and I. Because um, I can only share what happens to us. I can't share, you know, other things other people really um and um you know we found as we were walking around um you know we were just noticing more and you know we had these little cards can i just show one of those cards they weren't these in particular but um we had these little cards and we would write little messages to people you know generally 
there was a lady in a lovely garden and we just wrote a little letter just to say every time we walk by your garden is beautiful we love this you know and whoever the lord showed us we just did that you know and you know we use these cards and uh, sue's bought quite a lot of them here um, and as cwm team we write messages in these whatever the lord gives and we give them to whoever the Lord leads. And it's very simple because, you know, you don't have to be that brave, really, because you can just give it and then you can just, you know, run away then <laughs> if you want to. But um, they're really useful to do. But why not send things to the council leaders? Why not send to the GPs? You know, why not send to the people within the hospitals? Why not send it to whoever the Lord um, highlights to you um, and encourage them and let them know we're praying for them. It's amazing because very few people ever get any encouragements. And I just want to share a little bit more about um, my husband, uh, Ian. And just the because of the way the Lord has been um, working in him um, and because... Um, the Lord trusted him with a primary school, um, a Christian primary school, and so many seeds were sown. It was a hard, 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 hard ground. There were loads of battles, real battles, um, even from the church. In fact, it probably was especially from the church. Um, but Ian stood his ground because the word of God is the plumb line, and he couldn't allow anything that wasn't of the word to come into the school you know that's part of being a good like watchman you know good um being in charge you know um and he got a lot of um hassle a lot of there was a lot of attack um but because he was obedient to what um the holy spirit has shown him and he didn't waver from the, um, his calling, he never wavered from it. Um, the Lord has given him more favour within the town. And, you know, um, it's amazing the connections that he has. I, I'm, I'm amazed, I'm like, wow, how has that happened? You know? um, and so he finds himself now um, working with some of the council leaders, um, sort of, because of the levelling up fund, quite a lot of towns now have got extra money. And um, so we're in starting phase one, regeneration. And um, so there's developers coming in um, to regenerate the town, you know, and because at the moment it looks dreadful. <laughs> Everything's shut. It looks as though there's no hope. But then he finds himself in a meeting with these developers and planners and sharing about the um what saint helens is about what the town about because saint helens means light so he finds himself sharing about the light and about putting the heart back into the town now they're not overly spiritual words he's using but they really are of the spirit and he actually is found with others this actual center of the town and, and so, so together, together with the developers, they're going to put, they're calling it the Waymarker Project. You think, wow, this is amazing, the Waymarker Project. And then there'll be this Waymarker, which will show what it used to be like. But um, there's, it'd be full of light. And the, the actual motto for the town is Ex Terra Lucum, which means out of the ground comes light. If that's not resurrection town, then I don't know what is. You know, it's just amazing. Um, and, and you see, that, that all comes from just being obedient to the Lord. And so when he started going on this heritage trail with this friend, he came to this place um, and it's just in front. It's the canal. It's the canal. And um, it's in front of this place called Foundry Wharf. And... Um, I was talking to Bill Ab before, and he was saying that his friend actually is part of this, he's just come into this church, which is actually that area, which is amazing. And he was in the police, which is God's bringing people, you know. And um, this place, 
this canal was just very, very run down. I mean, you know, if you went there, if you didn't have spiritual eyes, it, looks, it looked hopeless. Place where all the drug addicts, you know, Salvation Army's there, you know, they do it openly. You know, there's drug needle, needles, all of that everywhere. Um, even the police wouldn't go down there. Um, it, it was a place of real, you know, hopelessness. And then... The Holy Spirit just touched his heart and said, well, do something about it, <laughs> you know? As people of God, we can do something about it. And so something stirred in him to say, well, why should we accept this? Why should we accept this for our children, for our families? So he found himself then connecting with the council leaders who, by the way, had never, ever been down there, never, ever walked and so when they said, can we have a meeting in the place? He said, no, I want you to come and walk with us. And so then the Lord showed him, just like the Nehemiah, who the people are who will work with him and who are the blockers. You know, like the uh, Sambale and the Tobias, the blockers. You know, he quickly found out who they were. And now it's beginning to transform. And now they've got this... Um, like a water sports thing developing on this canal stretch. And guess what it's called? Living Waters. Wow. And they don't, and they said it's a great name. These are all secular people. They have no idea. Living Waters. Wow. That's amazing. And they're going to do this place to store the canoes. Um, and we're going to have, again, with prophetic artists to do a design on it about living waters. And you're thinking, whoa, Lord, aren't you amazing? You know, um, and families are starting to come down to that area. They never would have done before. Now, I'm not saying it's there yet, but it's a work in progress. But the first thing that had to be done was to declutter it all, get rid of all the rubbish. And I can't tell you how much rubbish there was in the canal. So much rubbish. But people are beginning to notice and they're coming alongside him. You know, and this is about the gathering. You know, when things start happening, we will find people from, you know, secular will be interested and they'll start coming. You know, and this is all through. It's the fruit of intercession, you know. And we keep on interceding because, you know, God knows what he's made St. Helens for. God knows what he's made this place for. You know, you've had dreams and visions. You, this is the time when you will start actually seeing it happening. You know, this is the time. And, you know, we've just got to keep bold and keep strong and keep persevering. And when we get a bit down, gather more people with you and just say, come on, can we pray this through? It's about persevering in prayer, not giving up. You know, it's asking, going back to the Lord, well, what is going on? You know, seeing with the spiritual eyes, what is happening? So hope is arising because where there's no hope, it says what happens. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And that's why um, St. Helens is one of the places for a lot of sickness, a lot of sickness because they've been promised things time and time again and nothing's been delivered you know but they're beginning to see something emerging something and you only need to see something emerging and then it gathers that momentum you know it's that cataclysmic we are talking about is it, it, it develops you know and that's what we're designed for isn't it that's that's who we designed for and so um the final part of trying to put um, all of this together um, about the intercessors, um, the gatekeeper, the watchman. The story of Esther, that is the prime example. This is when we see it working effectively. It's an amazing story um, and I encourage you to read it again. But you see, it is about the intercessor it's about the watchman, it's about the gatekeeper. And they worked together to reverse the decrees made by Haman and King Xerxes, the secular ruling authority of the day. You see, when we are mobilized and we work together, 
we can stop the work of the enemy. See, even though Esther was in danger of losing her life, if she got it wrong, she was willing to go into the presence of the king. You know, Esther had strength. Why did she have the strength? Yes, it was God-given, but Mordecai, the watchman, the gatekeeper, was working with her. She wasn't isolated. You know, and so when we anointed you before, it's powerful that you were standing together, not isolated, you know. And God is mobilizing his troops. He's bringing his troops together, if you like, you know, um, because we are so much, um, there's so much more power when we work in unity. You know, again, it was reminded of, you know, when the Tower of Babel was being built and, you know, God looked and he saw, and they were all working, and he was like, "Well, there's absolutely nothing that they can't do, be, you know, because they're working together. And of course, they had the wrong motives because they wanted to build their own. Um, and then, he, so the God, you know, scattered them, he confused them, gave them a different language, you know. But then we know, don't we, at Pentecost, you know, after the after the resurrection of Jesus, he's beginning that restoration again, you know? Um, and that's why there was a release of the tongues, you know? Um, and, you know, this is the time when we start working together to build the house of God. Wow. In Haggai, we talked about it um, before. When we're bi- God is building his house. It's not man. You know, look at the mess we've made of the church because man has tried to build the church. No, Jesus builds the church. He's the cornerstone. It's God who does it. And he's building his house. And his house is going to be so glorious. Better, you know, the latter, the latter house, so much greater than the former one. Wow, because it's built of living stones. You see, the Tower of Babel is bricks and they're all the same living stones we're all unique so unity is not about doing the same thing it's about unity and diversity it's about working with one common aim it's working from the heart of the father the conjoined hearts that's what it's all about it's about you know us really just seeking him jesus seeking him what's his will what what we're part of his kingdom his kingdom, we work together to release it. Wow. And that's why, you know, the Holy Spirit is working and dealing with stuff. See, Mordecai, he sat in the gate every day outside the king's palace so he could hear and see what was happening. Esther, she was serving in the secular realm and the spiritual realm through prayer and fasting and when there was something important to report Mordecai Mordecai then relayed that information to Esther the intercessor and so together they were able to influence the king and as a result the enemy was defeated the new decrees were made to overrule what had gone before and to bring the freedom to the nation of Israel Unity, trust, and teamwork is so important. And so, so to conclude, if we have no watchmen, then the gatekeepers don't know when to open or shut the gate. The intercessors don't know what to pray about, and they can pray without ceasing but see little breakthroughs or transformation. If we've got no gatekeepers, is useless having the watchman. If we have no intercessors, then the work of the watchman and the gatekeepers is twice as hard. How important it is to work together. Psalm 133, we know it so well. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. As 
we listen and honor one another. As we live together in unity, we can see the power of God's blessing released, which can stop the flow of the enemy in its tracks. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about the um, CWM team, the Community Watchman Ministry, which uh, Sue heads up, because we're all from different denominations. But there's a oneness, because we all love Jesus. We never ever mention about which denomination we're from. And we have um, some people who are from the Catholic Church, from the Anglican Church, from you know Pentecostal, from all sorts of different churches. But that does not matter because we've been brought together to intercede, to have our eyes fixed on Jesus. And that's why there's a favor we believe over us because, you know, our heart is what the Father's heart is. You know, we pray, you know, that we're so conjoined with his heart that we hear what he wants to do with us and through us. You know, we're very transparent with each other. We're very vulnerable, but we know it's a safe place. And here, here is a safe place. It's a safe place where you can make mistakes. And um, one of the greatest things we have the joy of is when we have new people coming into our team. And, you know, they're just very um, sort of anxious, a bit of, you know, afraid and so forth. And just watching and discipling and just nurturing them and seeing how they grow in confidence because they know it doesn't matter if they make a mistake. And it's beautiful to watch, isn't it? So it's absolutely lovely to see it. And then you start seeing where, because probably, I think probably all of us have been hurt by church. I think all of us, without exception. And yet the love of God has really transformed each one of us, you know. And whenever we go anywhere, um, so when we went to the Cairngorms, there were 10 of us. And one of the um, responses afterwards from the leader was, um, the, the people were just amazed at the love that was within your group. You know, that's what it's all about. It's about the love of God flowing through us, you know. Um, and it's about us, you know, preferring one another, spurring one another on, encouraging one another, building one another up, you know. Um, when, when, when one of you suffer, we all suffer. When one of us rejoices, we all rejoice. I mean, we're going through a really heartbreaking time. One of our members, you know, a lovely, lovely couple have lost their daughter. You know, and it's so sad. Uh, but we grieve with them. We grieve with them because it's so hard, you know, and we will love them, we will support them until they get through this really difficult time. Although they know where the daughter is, the way it all happened was not good. But we know where the daughter is. You know, we know where Sarah is in heaven now. No more pain. But sometimes the trauma is not great. And that's when we need to walk alongside and help. You know, and it's that sensitivity to one another. You know, it's what Bob was talking about the body, wasn't he? You know, about all the parts of the body doing their bit. And all of us have different giftings within that body. No part is any more important than another. And it's about working together, you know. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's time that, you know, we really take on board the last prayer that Jesus made, John 17, when he said, you know, he prayed that we would be one as he was and is with the Father. And, you know, that must have been, well, the last prayer anyone prays is the most important. And he knew how hard it is for us to work together. But you see, we believe because we are in this new era, there is no time to waste now. And God will judge us now. You know, how we treat one another. When we're not one, we are offensive to Jesus and the price he paid for us to be one. And I don't want to do anything to offend Jesus. I want to do what pleases him. We are living in a serious hour. It's time to be really real with God and one another. If we've dishonored anyone, now is the time to repent, to get right with God and to bless one another. 
you know, it's time and we need to pray for our leaders every day and support them in whatever way the Lord tells us to. Gone are the days when we can moan and criticize and we can't do that anymore. We need to understand our authority and within which boundaries we can operate in. It's important to know where we are called to operate, whether it's family level, church level, community level, citywide level, regional level, national level, international level. But where, when we all work together, whatever boundaries God has placed in us, we will see a powerful difference. Unity commands a blessing. And this is why different people are coming. They're coming to places because they're finding where they need to be. You know? And we also need to understand the timing. We can't lag behind what God is saying to us and we can't run ahead. So really, really important. And so I just, um, I have no idea what time, uh, but I want to um, pray. I want to pray over us um, about the mobilization of the gatekeeper, the intercessor, the watchman, so that we can start working together using the giftings, the anointings that the Lord has. Okay. So you may want to stand as, uh, as we pray. Some of you are standing as watchmen. Some of you are standing as gatekeepers. And some of you are standing as intercessors. Each one so very, very vital. And so, Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you for what you are doing in these days. I thank you, Father, for the releasing of your Holy Spirit, the anointing over your people. And I pray, Heavenly Father, you would bring together a unity within these people, Father. Wherever they are from, I pray a unity will be released, Father, where they can start operating and working together in order that your kingdom will be advanced. I pray, Father, you bring to light any blockages where things are not happening. I pray, Father, for those in um, positions um, of the leadership, Lord, for strategy, for st strategy to know how to move forward, how to move forward in these days. But I pray, Father, that each one of us will really be awakened and alert to what you are needing from us in these days, Father. I pray, Father, you'd give us such a fresh desire to spend more time with you, to be more intimate with you, and to hear what you are saying to us in these days. I thank you, Lord God, for this place. I thank you, Lord God, for Robert, Lord, and for Helen. I thank you, Lord, for the leaders around them. I thank you, Lord God, for what, how you are preparing them, Father. And we pray, Lord God, you would really show them clearly the way forward. Father, I pray you will show them how to mobilize the, the people, Father, so that we can see things shifting and changing. We can see your kingdom coming here on earth as it is in heaven. And I pray this in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.